Welcome to Family Worship Center. We're so excited you're joining us today. In this crazy season we all find ourselves in, it is so important now more than ever to be connected. Connect with us on social media and get up-to-date information on what's going on in the Family Worship Center community, but also when and where to find services. If you'd like to be a part of what Family Worship Center is doing, you can choose any of the options on your screen and give whichever way is best for you. We'd love to hear from you. How are you doing? Let us know by shooting us an email at info at myfwc.church. Thanks again for joining us. Here's a wonderful message from one of our FWC pastors. Hope you enjoy. Welcome to church, everybody. It's so good to be back together again. We are three weeks into our state's no gathering mandate. So here we are. I'm actually just sitting here in my living room. and uh, But we're going to have church because you can't stop the church. The church was never a building. It was always about the people. So we're glad you're here. And it's going to be a great thing when we can all be together again. But for now, we're making the best of it. We hope you all are hanging in there, coping with it all okay. And uh, it looks like we've got some time yet before we're going to be back to normal. But you know what? I think we're going to come back from this better and stronger and uh, it's, it's going to be okay. We really want to take a minute and just thank the people on the front lines who are fighting this. You know, I kind of feel a little bit bad because what my country is asking of me is that I just like sit in my living room on my couch with my puppy and a blanket and popcorn and, and watch TV. And that's not the only thing I've been doing, but that's mostly what I've been doing. And uh, other people are actually putting their lives on the line. And we just want to say thank you. We want you to know if you're watching that we are thinking of you and we are praying for you, praying all the time that um, God's hand of protection is over you and your family and that you're going to be okay. And we just appreciate you and we want you to know that. So good job. Keep up the good work. And we really do value you in this season. Uh, we, uh, it would have been really nice if this virus had come with a warning sign, right? Or a memo that it put out like, Hey world, I'm going to be arriving on such and such a date and I'll be here for such and such length of time. And this is what it's going to cost you. But you know, it didn't come with any of that. And so here I'm wondering how long, just like you, we're wondering how long is this going to last? I mean, when it was first like two weeks, it's like, okay, we can handle two weeks. And then it went to 30 days. And, and now, I mean, just who knows? So we're asking those questions just like you. And, uh, you know, we just don't know. We just don't know what it's going to be like. There's no warning when things like this come up, but I don't know about you, but I found myself a few times just, and, and I really have to battle this. It's happened like four times, but I've been sitting at like just in the couch or wherever I'm at and my nose will start to run a little bit. And maybe I sneeze a couple of times and it's like, this thought comes into my mind. Oh, I wonder if I'm sick. I wonder if I've got the virus. And uh, I have to quickly grab those thoughts and, and not let my mind go there because, you know, that could be a really bad path to walk down. So hopefully you're guarding your mind, you're guarding your thoughts in this season and taking those thoughts captive because uh, I, I'm going to just choose to believe God's report that um, he's protecting me and he's watching over me and he's going to just keep me good, strong, and healthy. But it's kind of funny how our imaginations work and, and we have to be careful with that. This morning, I want to go to the Word and uh, we're going to look at in the book of John. So if you turn to John chapter 16, we're going to be looking at verse 33. And this morning, I'm reading out of the New Living Translation. So you can follow along and the words are up on the screen as well. It's Jesus talking and he says, I have told you all this so that you may have peace in me. Here on earth, you will have many trials and sorrows, but take heart because I have overcome the world. See, Jesus wasn't shy about the kind of struggling and, and the kind of the, the, the tough times that we were going to have in this life. He wasn't shy about it. He talked about it. He let us know. He says, you're going to have trials and struggles. And we really start learning this at a really young age, don't we? I was talking to my four-year-old niece and I started it out by just asking him, so what have you been doing? How, what, how have you been spending your time during this, this virus time? And she's like, I don't know. Because, you know, as a four-year-old, nothing has changed for her. She just, she gets up and she does every day what she's been doing every day before. And so it doesn't really change. But as you get older, right, life starts to, to have disappointment. Life starts to take some turns on you that can take you down some bad paths. And the older you get, the more consequences there are. The deeper it goes, the more pain you feel. And uh, that's just kind of how 
trials and struggles go. And, and I wish Jesus was a little more comforting when he said that. And, and, and he was, he finished that scripture with comfort that he's overcome. But not only does he tell us that we're going to have trials, but it says we're going to have many trials. Like could have lived without the word many, because I'd like to just have a few trials. I'd like to be in control of them. I'd like a memo to come in advance of when they're going to land in my pocket, when they're going to land on my lap so that I can plan. And then I can have a sense of control. And that's just not the way the world works. Jesus says that we're going to have many trials, many struggles. And if you've been alive very long at all, you know, that's, that's just how it goes. There's lots of struggles, lots of things that we have to, to overcome in our lives. Jesus, in another passage, we're going to turn to Matthew chapter 7, and we're going to read a little story that Jesus talks about. Matthew 7, 24 through 27, he's talking about some struggles again. He's telling a story, and it reads like this. Anyone who listens to my teaching and follows it is wise, like a person who builds a house on solid rock. Though the rain comes in torrents and the floodwaters rise and the winds beat against that house, it won't collapse because it is built on bedrock. But anyone who hears my teaching and doesn't obey it is foolish, like a person who builds a house on sand. When the rains and floods come and the winds beat against that house, it will collapse with a mighty crash. There's some things I want to draw out from this passage to bring to your attention. It kind of just caught me this week as I was preparing for today. Notice that the builders were building before the storm hit. It's talking about these builders who are out building and then the storm came. And this is an important point because I think it's important that we realize the best time to prepare for a storm is before the storm. Before the storm hits, that's the best time. Uh, if you wait till the storm hits, you're, you're going to be behind. I mean, all the toilet paper might be sold out, right? <laughs> we want to be prepared in advance and be all stocked up and stored up. So these builders, they were building before the storm hit. But, you know, sometimes we as humans, we like to procrastinate and we, we just kind of put our, our lives sometimes on cruise control and we're just kind of living life, going to work, doing what we do. And uh, we don't give it a whole lot of thought because, you know, there's no wind. There's no storm. We're just kind of living life. We're on cruise control. In fact, some people put more time investing and, and planning and thinking about a two-week vacation than they do on how they should live their lives. And I think this passage is saying that the wise builder is preparing, is building before the storm hits. And this morning, I think it's important that we think about how we've been doing and, and have, we been, have we been intentional? Have we been thinking about how we're going to build our life? And uh, I think it would be better if we were intentional about how we were going to be building instead of just reacting to the things that are being thrown at us. And uh, that's not a, a, an easy way to live is when we're just always playing catch up and always trying to deal with the things that life is serving up. It's better when we can just live intentionally, strategically, on purpose, by principle, live our lives, and then it gives us a strength, it gives us a confidence that we can go forward with. And uh, it needs, we need to be diligent about putting in the work before we need it, right? So it, just as an example, I, I have two types of friends. As we're dealing with this coronavirus and, and as if the virus wasn't bad enough, now we're dealing with a lot of economic issues and financial issues. And I, I have two types of friends. Really, I have three. So let me just preface my example with, with saying this. I have one type of friend who is struggling financially, but no fault of their own. I mean, they're just in a place, maybe they're a single parent, maybe they're a grandparent raising their grandkids, and they're just strapped for cash, just the way their life is. Maybe they were let go from their job, no fault of their own. And so so I get that there's people struggling financially, and it doesn't make you um, somehow irresponsible. I get that there's that group of people. But aside from that, so feel the love that I'm sending out, okay? It's all good. We're all good. But there are two other types of people. And I have some friends right now who are, you know, they're, everyone's in the same boat, right? We're all having to stay home and, and, and whatever. So these friends... Several years ago, probably like 10 years ago, there was a group of us and we just, you know, we got turned on to Dave Ramsey. Shout out to Dave Ramsey, uh, Financial Peace University. And we all could just kind of decided as kind of a friends group, as kind of our church, a, a core group of people in our church, that we wanted to be smart. We wanted to be wise builders in our finances. Because how many of you know, like, 
life isn't an emergency. Uh, sometimes we treat like Christmas. Let's just take Christmas for an example. We get to Christmas time, and I've done this so many times in my life. It's like Christmas is a month away. How am I going to buy all those gifts? I have no idea. And yet, Christmas isn't a surprise. It comes every year, December 25th. And yet, so many of us, it like just creeps up on us. And now it's here and we don't know. So then we go and we put everything on a charge card. And, and, and it just, it's the cycle that's really difficult. So uh, uh, several years ago, probably 10 years ago, we decided we want to do some things differently. And uh, so I have this group of friends and we've been living this life together. And over these last 10 years, we've been, we've been doing the steps, baby steps. And uh, first step is get your emergency fund, your $1,000. And that's really quite easy to do. I, I found it quite easy to do. I just sold a bunch of stuff that I didn't need anymore. And I was practically there. And then the second step, get out of debt. You know how nice it is in this time not to have to make a car payment, not to worry how you're going to make those credit card payments? I'm telling you, it's a, it's a really good place to be in. And then that third baby step of saving three to six months worth of, of savings. So I have friends who are at that point where they've got a fully funded emergency account. And that means that you've got three to six months worth of living expenses. So this virus hits and, and you're laid off from your job, you're fine. You're not sweating it in a financial sense because you've done the work. You've put it in. You were building your life before the storm hit so that you were prepared to handle the storm. See, that's how it works when you're intentional about it. But over these last 10 years, those same friends, they made sacrifices. They decided what they wanted. They saw the future and they knew where they wanted to be. And so they weren't eating out for dinner at restaurants and spending a bunch of money. They weren't buying the fancy handbags. They weren't, you know, they were sacrificing and, and cutting corners, not cutting corners, but you know, like trying to save and, and put stuff away so that they could get into the place. I have some friends in this group, not only have they fully funded their, their, um, their emergency account, they've paid off their homes. They have no mortgage in this time. Man, that would be really nice. I'm not there yet, but man, they are just in a really good place, but they sacrificed and they built and they planned and they strategized and they were intentional about it. Then I've got this other group of friends and uh, man, they are really kind of losing their minds right now. They do not know what they're going to do. Pulling their hair out. They're scared. They don't know how they're going to put food on the table. They don't know how they're going to make their payments. They don't know what what's going to come of all of this. And uh, the good news is that most of America is in the same boat. So, you know, we're all in this together. But, you know, um, I also know that some of these people, man, they were, you know, all, while my other friends were saving and, and skimping and, and being really frugal and tight with their money and careful with their money, this other group, you know, we're just, we're just out getting our nails done and drinking Starbucks. There was a day in my life when I'd stopped at Starbucks on the way to work and on the way home from work. And Starbucks is not cheap. It's expensive. It will really catch up with you. But you know what? We, we spend money on stuff. We are getting our hair done, getting our nails done and drinking the coffee and going out to eat and going out with our friends and doing all the things. And guys, you're not exempt. You may not be getting your hair done and your nails done, but you got the things that you spend your money on. So before you, you go there and start getting mad at your spouse or your girlfriend because of all the money she's blowing through, we know you've got your things too. So don't think you're off the hook. But, uh, you know, it's like we have to have the shoes, we have to have the handbags, and we have to have all this stuff, but we need to take some time. We need to think about that direction that we're going in, which really leads me to the second point. We're building our lives, and we should be building before the storm, be thinking and being intentional. But this scripture it talks about builders, and he said that there's one builder who's wise and one builder who's foolish. So I want to look at the difference here a little bit. So we have a choice to build Let's start with the foolish builder, okay? It tells us that the, the, the foolish built, builder built his life, built his house down on the sand, down at the beach, where it looks pretty. We like the sound of the beach. We like the sound of the waves. But did you know sand is not very strong? You notice that we don't really build homes out of sand. We don't build cars out of sand. You don't build clothes out of sand. Why? Because it's not strong. We use wood. We use metal. We use steel. We use concrete because those things are strong. We don't use sand because sand is weak. Sand is fragile. Sand doesn't have a foundation. You can't stand up to it. I've spent some time, I've been blessed to be able to spend some time at the beach, you know, from time to time. We're not that far in Western Washington. We're not that far from the beach. And uh, I love this. You go down to the beach. 
and you get out there in the day and you pull up in your car, you know, you drive up on the beach and you set out, you open up your trunk, you get out your blankets and your umbrellas and all your toys and you kind of set up for the day at the beach. And so along the day, people, little kids, you know, they're building their sand castles and you see people writing their names or love messages in the sand. And you got all that. One year I was there and I had seen Pinterest. Okay. Pinterest. I'm one of those people who I see an idea in Pinterest and I think, oh, I could do that. That's awesome. So I saw this Pinterest picture and uh, people had built like this, like a sofa, like a couch, but it was round, but there was like a, um, a trench where your feet go. And then there was this bench seat and then it had a back, but it was all in the sand. And then there was like a fire pit. I don't know if you guys have seen that picture, but, um, that was the picture in my head. So I started in on it cause I'm like, I could do that. It's sand, right? Well, it was a lot harder and it took a lot more time and mine certainly didn't look even close to the picture, but I was committed. I want you to know I was committed. But here's the thing about all that. You can spend the whole day, and at the end of the day, there's just, there's sandcastles, there's there's notes written in it, but you come out the next day, and what I find interesting, and I actually find it refreshing because it reminds me of a new beginning, the entire beach, the entire sand is completely flat and perfect again. All the sandcastles are gone. All the messages that were written are gone. My perfect little couch and bonfire just gone in a moment, and uh, that's because the waves came in, the tide came in, right? And it took out all of that stuff because none of that stuff was structurally sound. It cannot hold up against the power of the waves. So when Jesus is talking about the foolish man who built his house on the sand, that's what he's talking about. When you build your life on that, it just cannot stand up to the power of the waves. And you know what? When we build our lives like that, we aren't gonna be able to stand up to that either. A marriage can't handle waves forever. There's only so many conflicts and so much struggle that it can handle before it just won't handle. I mean, one day you're married and then one day you're not. And it could be months, it could be years, it could be decades. But a marriage built on sand is not gonna hold up. Finances built on sand is not going to hold up eventually. And you know, a, a lot of these things, your marriage, our finances, our health, you know, a body is not going to hold up forever. A, a body built on Big Macs and French fries is not going to endure till the, at, for the long haul. You know, we need to be feeding it good things. So we have to understand that, that the waves are going to hit and everything on the sand is going to buckle underneath it because the waves are just stronger. And so we need to realize that and be mindful and not be the foolish builders. See, when your life is built on the sand, everything is shallow and fragile. It's delicate. It's vulnerable. Your emotions are fragile. Your health is fragile. Your finances are fragile. Your relationships are fragile. And then the storm comes and, you know, will you have enough to, to endure? Sometimes, and sometimes we see people, as a pastor, I see people devastated all the time by life. Things happen. And I feel horrible when stuff like that happens. And so that's why I wanna I want to tell people, I wanna encourage people, before the storm hits, be thinking, be mindful, be diligent about how you're building. Of course, there is another option. He talks about another kind of builder who builds on the solid rock, a sure foundation. And scripture teaches us that that's the wise way to build. When you build your life on the rock, your life has depth. It has, it, it goes down deep. You have roots that go down deep. When the waves come, when the winds blow, you're not just easily unmoved. Everything just doesn't like totally rattle you and get you off course. You're not just set off like that. Because why? Because you're on a sure, strong foundation and you can handle the wind. Doesn't mean you're not gonna feel it, right? You're gonna feel the wind blow. Doesn't mean you're not gonna hear it. It can be happening all around you. Doesn't mean that you're not gonna have some windows shattered, some shutters blown off, some the roof blown off. I mean, it doesn't, I, I have seen people whose a storm has come into their life, like in their marriage, um, adultery, betrayal, horrible things. And let me tell you, they felt it. They struggled. It was difficult to walk through. It was difficult to help them walk through it. But I want to tell you, there was something in them. They had a depth to them. They had a confidence to them. I have a good, good friend who just 
a couple years ago, it's maybe it feels like it was just last month, but it was probably two years ago. I don't know the timeline, but within the last two years, very good friend of mine diagnosed with breast cancer. It's not fair. She's a great person. She doesn't deserve that. How many know that's how cancer works? There, <laughs> it shows no favoritism whatsoever. And so this this my friend, she gets this diagnosis. But you know what? She is one of those build my life on the rock type of people. And the doctor gave her the news. But as the doctor was giving her the news, God gave her some other news. And you know what God said to her? He said, you're going to be okay. And it was that phrase that you're going to be okay that got her through that whole thing. And I want to tell you that in that entire struggle of her fighting cancer, that woman never gave up. She she might have slowed down a little bit, but I didn't see it. The people around her didn't see it. She might have been maybe slower at home. Maybe she she gave herself the grace. I hope she did. I hope she gave herself some grace to, to be slower. But man, she was faithful. She showed up. She was at church. She served. She did all the things that she would have done had she not been sick. And you know, I can't help but think that comes from that inner strength from having built your house all those years on the rock because there's a strength that comes. And so, yeah, it doesn't mean that she's not going to get the cancer diagnosis. It doesn't mean that there's not going to be something. It doesn't mean that you're not going to lose your job because your life is on the rock. It means very much so you're going to have those things happen, but you don't have to be destroyed and your life doesn't have to be devastated by them. There is a way to, to survive it. And it's because your house is built on the rock. There's a peaceful confidence that can come into a person's life when their life is built on the rock, knowing that God's got this and we're going to be okay. I want to bring up a, a third point and, and it's kind of this point where maybe you're, you're listening to this and there's a little bit of a disconnect because like, I don't know, as I was thinking about this, I realized that it's possible to have built your life on the rock. So when we get saved, when we get born again, it tells us that we go spiritually from, you know, living this life on the sand to living this house on the rock because Jesus is, you know, that rock. And so we have this new life in him. And yet maybe you're here listening to what I'm talking about today. And you're like, well, I'm building my life on the rock. I I'm saved. I believe in God. I go to church. I, I pray. I read my Bible. My life, I'm building my life on the rock. And yet I identify with what it's like to live on the sand. And uh, I just want to talk about that conflict, that inner kind of tension that happens. And, you know, I could only really kind of think about it in, in this analogy, in this illustration. This illustration is not foolproof. It's, it's not exact. But I think it demonstrates a, a point. See, when you accept Jesus into your life and, and you get saved or born again, you move from the sand, in a spiritual sense, you move from the sand to the rock. And obviously, I'm not talking about physically. I'm not talking about naturally. You're, I'm talking spiritually. When you ask Jesus in your life, he moves you from the sand and, and he sets you up on the rock because now your life is planted in him. And uh, you need to be confident in that. You need to be assured of that. And if you're not, we will, we'll talk about that later. But the problem is, is that when we get saved and, and Jesus gives us this new home up on the rock, it's that most of us, in fact, probably all of us, we keep a little storage shed of things that we like down on the beach. We don't move everything up into the house all at once. So up in the house, it's good. There's, you know, God's there. There's peace. There's joy. There's goodness. There's all of the things that God brings into our lives. But yet there remains this storage shed of our old life, of our old self, down on the beach. And that's where the problem comes in. And that's why we feel inner conflict. It's kind of even what the, the, the apostle Paul was talking about in scripture when he said, you know, the things I want to do, I don't do. The things I don't want to do, I do. It's just this dichotomy of who we are. And uh, we've got this little storage shed that we all like to kind of, you know, we have attachments to those things in there. And sometimes, you know, we're, we're good Christians and we're, we're doing good. We're running the race and we're full of faith. But then something comes into our life and it's kind of like we're like, oh, I know how to handle that. And we run back to the shed because we're like, we have something down in the shed that will help us with there. So we run back to the shed looking for that tool, looking for that way. And that's where we get into trouble because we keep going back to that old self. And that's, the problem with that is that that's the foolish way to handle it. And so when it comes to our marriage and how we're dealing with our marriages, you know, we have to make this choice. Are we gonna do it God's way? 
building our life on the on the rock on the sure foundation or are we going to still be going to our wheelhouse in that storage shed and pulling out the things that we've always used and, and jesus tells us that that's not so wise. It's the foolish way to go. So that's why it's possible for a Christian who's saved and born again and, and, and doing their best to live this godlike life, right? To sometimes not act very much like a Christian, to sometimes have some attitudes, sometimes handle things not the best way because we all kind of revert back to this storage shed. And that's really the whole point of the Christian walk here on earth is to, to try to move out of the storage shed, to, to get rid of all that stuff and, and to move up permanently into the main house up here on the rock. And if we could all figure that out and do that, I, I'm, I'm sad to say that I have been following God for most of my life, all of my life, 46 years. I mean, I've been following God for 26 years, right? All of my life. I'm a pastor for heaven's sake, and I still have a storage shed down on the beach. And uh, this crisis that we're in, this coronavirus thing, I I've gone out to that shed a few times, just dealing with my family, dealing with my husband, and uh, I'm, I'm not proud of that, but you know, we all do it. And that's my point, is that you know, even the most holy person you know, and they have, they have their things. And our Christian faith, that's what it means to work out your salvation. It's like we're always constantly trying to bring those things from the storage shed and turn them over and let find a different way to do it, God's way of doing it. So our finances, how we parent, our marriages, our careers, our our jobs, our entertainment, all of those things need to be brought up to the main house. And that is where the struggle is. And I want you to be encouraged. It's a process. It takes time. You're not going to do it perfectly. Uh, we're human and we make mistakes. And some of us are really human, right? And some of us are more stubborn than others. But uh, I want to tell you, there is a different way. And when we'll build our lives on the rock, that is going to be the wise way. It's going to lead to life and peace. It's going to lead to good fruit. It's going to lead to good things. And that's what we want, right? We all want to live a good life. And I believe we're all doing the best that we can, but we need to be mindful of these things. We need to take inventory. And I pray that during this this pandemic, this time when we're ordered to stay at home, that we'll give some thought to some of these things. Even maybe after hearing this message today, maybe some husbands and wives would sit down together and even discuss, you know, are there some things that maybe we're not doing so smart? Are there some things that we're, we're doing? Is there a better way to do it? Do we need to see what, maybe it's just kind of analyze some things in our lives and, and, and give some introspection and, and see some things that we could do better. See, having the storage unit down at the shed, that's expensive. Storage units are expensive. I can't believe how many storage units there are in town, in our little town. It's like, man, we have houses to store our stuff in, and yet we have so much stuff, we still need a storage unit. It's crazy, and they're expensive. But your storage shed down on the beach, it's expensive too, because it's costing you the fullness of what God has for you. It's costing you the fullness of joy that he has, the fullness of his will and his plan. I want to tell you, God's plan for you is good. God's plan for you is better than what you could plan for yourself. God's plan for you is perfect. And uh, the more we can get, the more things we can get, the more issues we can get up into the main house where God is and building our lives on those solid foundation, that's those solid principles that we find in God's word, the better off we're going to be for it. And uh, I, I just, uh, in closing, we're going to wrap this up. I just want to talk about the rock for a second because I think this is important. It says that the foolish builder built his house on the sand, but the wise builder built his house on the solid rock. And so I would say, where is this rock? What kind of rock? Do we use granite? Do we use basalt? Should we use um, pumice or slate or shale? Like, what kind of rock? See, the rock is not a where, and the rock is not a what kind. The rock is a who, and the rock is Jesus, of course, right? It's Jesus. Jesus is the solid rock that we can build our lives on. Jesus and his words, the, the truths, the principles from his word, that's how we build our lives on it. You know, the world has all kinds of knowledge for us of what's a great marriage and how to do your finances, but I want to tell you that there is a best way, and that is God's way. And, uh, you know, I even know people who don't even believe in God, but they do God principles. 
They, 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 the way they spend their money and the way they treat their spouses, it, it's all from the Bible. It's, it, they may not even know it, but it's a good way and they live good lives because his principles work. His principles are wise and they're going to make us have better lives. And so just quickly, I, you don't need to turn these. I'm going to read these really quick. There's just a few scriptures that talk about Jesus being the rock. Psalms 18.2 says, The Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer, my God, my rock in whom I take refuge, my shield and the horn of my salvation, my stronghold. 2 Samuel 22.2 says, He said, The Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer. And Isaiah 28, 16 says, Therefore, thus says the Lord God, Behold, I am the one who has laid a foundation in Zion, a stone, a tested stone, a precious cornerstone of a sure foundation. You see, the rock is a who. And if you're listening to me today, I'm going to ask you to be really honest with yourself, okay? Here are some signs. Now, these aren't all the signs. These aren't everything. They're just some indicators. There's just some like warning flags that I want you to ask yourself because I want you to be honest. And uh, would you say that your life is best described as being built on the sand or being built on the rock? So, so here's some, some things to ask. If you're scared and fearful, if you're anxious, panicked, worried, if your relationships are like a time bomb just waiting to go off, if tensions are high and you feel like you're just going to lose it, if your financial situation is on the brink of collapse, if you feel like you have no control, you feel like there's no hope, you can't see any light at the end of a very dark tunnel. These are just some of the signs that you might be building your life on the sand and you might want to give it some consideration because here's the great thing about Jesus being the rock. It's never too late. It's never too late for you. You haven't gone too far. You haven't messed up too bad. You can make a comeback. You can turn this thing around. I promise you, I've seen it. I work with people all the time. I'm around people all the time who have the story of how they were broken. It was going bad. They were on the wrong path. And yet they put their faith in Jesus, the rock, and he turned their lives around. I want to tell you, it happens all the time. I see it all the time. I'm around it all the time. I see it. And, and so I just want to encourage you with that today, that if you'll put your faith in Jesus, if you'll put your hope and, and build your life on that solid rock, you too can have a great, awesome life. It doesn't mean you won't struggle. It doesn't mean you're not going to have storms. It doesn't mean you're going to never feel rattled or, or shaken. But I'm telling you what, you can stand and you can endure when Jesus is your rock. This morning, I'm going to take a few moments. I want to pray with some people. Um, you might be listening to me today and you've, you don't know Jesus. You're not in a relationship with Jesus. You've never been in a relationship with Jesus, never been born again. Or, or maybe you're listening to me and you've walked with Jesus before, but you've walked away. And I'm just going to, I want to pray with you. I want to pray for you. I want to just bring you to a point closer to Jesus. And you know what the great thing about God is? He understands you and he understands our human weakness and he understands our doubt and our fear. So you can pray this prayer today and uh, I'm just, I'm going to invite you to do that. And I want you to know that as you do that, as you reach out to God, God's going to reach out to you. Here's what scripture teaches. It says that Jesus, he stands at the door of your heart. Okay. Now this is also, he's not at your front door. So don't worry. He stands at the door of your heart and he's knocking. He knocks just nice. <laughs> what I mean is he's not bold. He's not aggressive. He's not loud. He's not arrogant. He's not mean. He's not angry. He's just standing there at the door of your heart and he's just knocking. And scripture goes on to tell us that if anyone will open the door and invite him in, he'll come in. He won't force his way in. He's not going to knock down the door. But if you'll go to the door and you'll open it. And this morning, I want you to know that God is knocking on your heart. And if you'll just open up that door He's going to come in. And the thing about Jesus is that he is not demanding. He is not rude. He doesn't make you do things. He's a good friend and he'll walk with you and he'll go at your pace and he'll love you all the way. And he will reveal himself to you. If you'll give him a chance, God will make himself real to you. And so you have to start though, by asking him into your life because he's not going to force his way in there. He's not going to make you do it. So this morning we're going to pray a prayer. 
if you've never asked Jesus into your heart or maybe you've walked away and uh, it's time for you to come back, I actually want you to pray this prayer with me. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to pray out loud and I'm going to pause between it. And as I say a phrase, I want you to repeat the phrase after me. We're actually going to put this this prayer up on the screen so you can even pause the video right now or or take a screenshot so that you have this prayer because maybe you're not ready to do it right now maybe it's awkward maybe you're in a group of people and uh it, it would just be weird for you but you can get this screenshot or however you want to do it and when you have a moment when you can get alone with god i want you to pray this prayer and uh, this is the beginning point. This is the starting point. This, this moves you off of the sand and gives you that main house up on the rock that I was talking about, right? And so that's the first step is you got to get off the sand and you got to get to a place where you can go to. And uh, so would you pause with me for a moment and we're going to pray. And I just want you to repeat this prayer with me. Dear Jesus, I invite you to come into my life. I want to start building my life on you. Please help me. I'm asking you to be the Lord and Savior of my life. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, thank you for praying that prayer with me this morning. But I'm not done yet. I want to pray for one more, one more thing. I want to pray for all of you all who are watching, who you have, you're walking with Jesus. You've already, you, you have previously prayed that prayer that we just prayed and you're saved. And, uh, but maybe you're struggling and maybe you see yourself like, you see yourself as a Christian, you go to church, you, you know, you do all the, the things that we're supposed to do. And yet you find yourself in this season and you're scared. And, and I get it. I mean, it's not the best of times, but you're scared or maybe that old anxiety. Remember that anxiety that lives down in that storage shed and you've been doing so good, but that anxiety is just wanting to, you know, you keep wanting to go back there. Your mind is just pulled to that or it's depression or it's whatever it is. Maybe your marriage. Uh, I was actually talking to a, a police officer during this time of this, this virus, he said that the domestic violence calls are up by like 200% just since this whole thing started. So, I mean, there are some families experiencing some stress, some conflict. And, and this morning, we're going to pray for you. It doesn't mean you're not saved anymore when you mess up. It doesn't mean that God walks away from you. Just saying that there's still some bad behaviors and still some bad habits that we tend to go to in when the wind starts blowing. And I'm just going to pray for you that God would uh, just kind of redirect your thoughts and redirect your mind and that you would just kind of be able to wrap your head around all this in a different perspective and, and keep your feet, keep your life planted on that solid rock that he'll sustain you. So could we take a moment and just pray? Father, in Jesus' name, I pray for our church body. I pray for anyone listening to this, to this message today, God. Lord, we love you and, and we believe in you. We believe that you're living in our hearts. You're in our lives. And we appreciate that so much, God. But Lord, I pray for those who are also struggling with doubt and fear and panic, anxiety and depression, for those marriages who are experiencing so much struggle and tension and, and relationships that are just uh, in conflict. I pray for those children and parents who are struggling. Maybe they're finding themselves with lots of time together and it's difficult, it's painful. Lord, I pray for finances, people who they just don't know what they're going to do. God, maybe they haven't been all that smart with their finances. Maybe they don't have that emergency fund built up. Maybe, you know, they're just, they're really struggling, God. And I just pray for them. I pray for all of these people who are struggling, maybe in their health too, Jesus. Lord, that you would strengthen your church, strengthen your body, Lord. Just minister comfort and, and peace during this time. Jesus, I pray that you would heal all those broken pieces in our lives. And God, use this situation to reveal to us. Holy Spirit, we just invite you to reveal to us those broken areas, those places that, you know, we're, we're living out of the shed instead of at the main house. Lord, I pray that you would make it known to us those places. And then, God, that we would hear what you're saying to us. We would recognize what you're showing us. And we would take steps, we would take action to fix those things, to, to begin to work out our salvation in those areas, God. We thank you that you never leave us, you never forsake us, you are with us, you haven't left us. God, the world feels so dark right now, and yet here you are, right here in the midst of us. 
And Jesus, we thank you that you don't leave us, that you are our rock that we can build our lives on and that we're going to come out of this okay. We're going we're gonna to be just fine. So Lord, we commit these things to you and I just pray for everybody listening today. You'd be with them, comforting them, protecting them, God. We thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We're so glad that you joined us today. I, I do want to encourage you that if you prayed that prayer for the very first time to ask Jesus into your life, I'm going to ask you to please, please, please let us know because we just want to pray for you. We want to just, even if we never talk to you, we want to be, we want to know that God is working in your life and we want to be praying for you. And so we need to know that so we know how to pray. I don't know what platform you're using today, whether you're looking at Facebook or YouTube or maybe you're on our website, but I know that in all of those platforms, there are buttons, there are links to get to our connect page. So we want you to connect. It's just a form. You're just going to put in some simple information and uh, you just can say, yes, I prayed. I accepted Jesus today. There's some other options there as well, but you can check that out. Please, please, please take a minute. It's going to take you like less than a minute to fill out this form. So fill it out and just let us know because we want to join with you and pray for you. And uh, we're just excited that you prayed that prayer. So please connect with us. Hey, you guys, we miss you so much. Uh, man, I'm typically an introvert. I, I like being home. I, I don't like big crowds and I'm not the party person. I like to be kind of alone and I, I'm just fine with that. But man, this has been a long time. So even for us introverts, we're even starting, I can't even imagine what extroverts are going through right now. I'm sorry. If you're married to an extrovert or you have kid, you're living with an extrovert, I'm really sorry. Um, Cause I just, that's, I, I live with some. So I kind of experienced that a little bit. But um, us introverts even are starting to be like, okay, it's time to go out, right? It's time to see people. And uh, so I know that uh, this is going to wear thin on all of us. But you know what? We're going to be okay. We're going to make it. We're so glad that you joined us today. We'll be together soon. And until then, have a great day.